Um, so hi everyone, my name is Akash. I am the medical registrar who's kind of coordinated this webinar series that will be ha happening every week on Wednesdays. Uh, our topic today is on delirium. Um, but just before we get into that, we've got Daniel Tyler, who's from the VMA, who's just going to, uh, who is just going to say a few words. Um, we're very much thankful for the VMA for sponsoring these webinars. And I will hand it over to Daniel Tyler. Perfect. Thanks, Akash. Uh, so, yeah, so you've seen the post a few things in the chat. Um, there's also a thing on the screen. Um, so if you use that QR code, uh, we'll send you a, a, a support pack. So it doesn't mean you're signing up to the to membership. It just means we're sending you a sort of a, this digital support pack, regardless of whether you're a member or not. So it's free to everyone. doesn't mean you're signing up. Um, usually we give you, we sort of chuck loads of pens and there's different freebies at you, but as we can't do that, can't be there. Uh, we just want to give you something anyway. So yeah, QR code will be in the top corner uh, throughout the presentation as well. So if you haven't done it yet, uh, as I'm moving on, you can do it while I'm talking, I don't mind. So yeah, so I'm Dan, I'm just going to talk about uh, BMA membership. I'm sure you're members or you've been a member at some point. So you know a bit about um, what we do and what you sort of get as, as a member. Um, so treat us as a bit of a refresher and I'm hoping uh, you might also find out something uh, new. So we're obviously the trade union and uh, professional association for doctors and med students in the UK. Um, we act as the voice of the profession, representing you individually, locally and nationally on all the issues that affect you. Um, so just to speak a little bit around COVID, um, you may have seen different BMA representatives uh, on the news over last year. Um, and we've been obviously voicing the issues surrounding the pandemic um, with a particular focus on, of course, on the protection of healthcare workers. You can visit our website and um, we have got a dedicated part of the website to COVID. So uh, if you want to see what we're doing uh, to address sort of ongoing issues for healthcare workers on a daily basis, um, you can do so. We also have a 24 seven emergency helpline for advice on PPE and other sort of COVID concerns. So this is again, is free for, for members and non-members. So if you have any concerns at all, uh, anything ahead of vaccinations around vaccinations, PPE or just anything at all, you, you can get in touch with us. So going back to what we do sort of more generally, um, we aren't an indemnity uh, company, so we sometimes get confused with MDU and MPS, um, but we don't deal with patient complaints. We're here solely to look after you, uh, your working conditions, so things like pay, contracts, your well-being, and also your professional development. So we understand the sort of things you, you might encounter, particularly when you become a junior or even or even now sort of ending uh, med school. Um, so we can give you advice on any of the issues you, you might face. Um, so this can be anything from, from working hours to relationships with, with senior staff. So just keep us in mind and we can uh, take some pressure off you if you're facing anything you feel you need support with. Um, a big part of what we do is, is obviously supporting you with employment issues. So just ahead of, of, of starting F1, you may have heard, of, have heard of our contract checking service, which can save you time and potentially quite a bit of money. Um, it's probably the key, key tool that you'll, you'll use if you use BMA services this year. Um, so we will check your contract within five working days, comparing it to a national model that we negotiated. Um, and if there's any discrepancies, we can help get it sorted. So th they don't always mean to, but trust can sometimes slip in extra things to your contract or, or change wording um, to mean sort of the opposite of what it should do. Um, so we just want to make sure your contract is correct and you're getting paid what you, what you should be. So it's quite staggering, but 20% 20, 20 of the contracts we checked for F1s last year were incorrect. So, so that was as high as one in five of you. Um, and it's, it's just too high of a number. So if you guys sort of all join and send your contracts, then we can, we can uh, make sure that you're all getting what you should be from the get-go, preferably before you've signed it as well. You can also check your roads compliant by using our, our road checker uh, tool, which is online, where you can just enter the details and it will flag up uh, if it's wrong or not. Um, as you guys are finding your students, um, you're actually eligible for the for the full BMJ, so the proper doctor uh, version of the BMJ at the moment. It doesn't happen automatically, so if you want that, if you want that delivered every every Friday, uh, just get in touch with us and say I'm a final year and I want I want that version. Uh, alternatively, you can also opt out and be completely paperless and just have the the app version. Oh. Uh, as part of membership as well, you get access to our clinical and non-clinical learning tools. So you'll have full access, access to BMJ Learning, uh, which has over a thousand uh, clinical and non-clinical modules. There are courses and modules uh, for exam revision as well, uh, if you still need them, and also looking ahead to completing your e-portfolio when you begin your F1. Uh, it's all very interactive, lots of audio and video module, modules to, to help you in, in more sort of simulated environments. Um, and obviously, it's kept very up to date with, with practice changing uh, developments. Uh, and for each module we do, you can also print off a, a certificate. 
Uh, BMA Library has thousands of ebooks and journals plus research services, which you can access from anywhere. Library itself is obviously closed at the moment uh, due to COVID, but like I said, you can you can access all the ebooks and e-journals anywhere. Um, and we also have a series of, of webinars which are free for members and they're held live throughout the year and also available to view again on demand. Uh, if you're thinking about your specialty options already, you can use our specialty explorer tool, which helps you get a bit better picture of what suits you best. So that one's an online psychometric test, which takes about 20 minutes to complete. It'll ask all sorts of work-life balance questions, then it'll give you a, a detailed report listing your top suit specialities uh, according to the answer you're given. Um, it's very easy to use, just, just tick boxes, and then it covers all specialities and the reports are, are very, very thorough and uh, give a, a big uh, sort of analysis of your answers. Um, if at any time you feel you'd like to speak to someone about your, your well-being, um, even now or when you become an F1, um, our services are open 24-7 to all to all students and doctors, uh, and you'll have the choice of either speaking to a, either a counsellor or a peer support doctor. Um, these services are, are completely confidential, free of charge, and open to everyone, regardless of whether you're in membership or not. So just to wrap up, um, I put some stuff in the in the uh, in the chat, some links. So if you're not currently a member, there's a bit of an offer because I've been invited along today. Um, if you use the QR code on the screen or the link on the screen, it's the same thing. Um, you get a ten pound Amazon voucher. So this works uh, for first time joiners and also if you're rejoining uh, and obviously you're free to to leave as, as you wish. Uh, membership family students is three pounds sixty six a month. So the ten pound Amazon voucher is like giving away three months free for Amazon. Um, and yeah, just one last chance to sign up to receive the digital support pack. But the link, the link for that as well, is is in the is in the chat. So again, that's not signing up for membership. That is just to, to get some free stuff for us, equivalent to pens and whatnot. Um, that's it for me. Thanks for listening to me, and I'll let you you start the session properly. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. Perfect. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, delirium for FY1. I'm Akash. I'm a medical registrar uh, specialising in endocrinology and diabetes. Um, I've also uh, done a couple of teaching qualifications um, and that's me. Um, just a shout out to the MDU for also sponsoring this event. Um, so just remember that all, all F1s do need some form of indemnity as well um as you uh, using the bma for that support and they will offer you some free gifts if you sign up with them we posted a link again um to sign up on the chat so talking about delirium things that i'm going to go through are an introduction of what delirium is the different types uh how to assess delirium what in the investigations involve and then the management and i'll go through each of those sections so the first question, the first thing to consider is why is it important? Well, it's important because it's very common. As, a, as an F1 on the ward, uh, whether you're on medicine or surgery, unless you're in paediatrics, you're gonna see lots of delirium. It affects about 20 to 30% of patients on the medical wards and up to 10 to 50% of patients uh, after they've had surgery, um, in particularly the elderly cohort. And it's frequently associated with life-threatening pathologies and it can be very difficult to assess these patients the, the reasons are are they're confused they can be quite aggressive um, and for those reasons it can be very difficult to examine these patients or be able to take a history from them so you might be on call and this is a very common bleep that you might receive um, so your bleep from uh, Sarah who's a nurse who's a nurse on a cornwall and she tells you this, that Mr. Andrews is on the ward and he's presented confused following a fall. His past medical history includes diabetes, uh, hypertension, dementia, and he's confused. And so you're asked to go attend to him and see if you can provide some help because they're very worried about whether the fact that he's confused might suggest that he's unwell. You're given some observations his heart rate is 115, his respiratory rate is 20, so he's tachycardic uh, with a borderline normal, normal higher respiratory rate. His blood pressure is 102 over 75, so that's mildly low, and his temperature is 
is borderline raised at 37.9 and SATs are normal. You have a look at, his in, look at his investigations from the computer and you find that he's come in and when he had his uh, admission bloods, his inflammatory markers were raised, he had a mild AKI, and he had an ECG, which showed a sinus tachycardia. Well, here are the types of delirium. So the different types of delirium include hypoactive delirium, hyperactive, and, and the mixed type. Hyperactive is, tends to be quite obvious. Patients are agitated, psychotic, aggressive. They're often trying to punch or push or kick they're trying to get out of the bed and this poses quite a significant risk to the patient because what they can do is they can fall out of bed and injure themselves but also they can impact the safety of staff and other patients. Hypoactive delirium is often missed. This is the leth lethargic inattentive patient, the sleeping patient. They're often deemed the good patient because they're not really asking for anything much, uh, they're not really demanding much from the nursing staff or the medical staff, but that's actually because they're delirious and have no idea what's going on. And that's really something to watch out for. So it's really important that when you do assess a patient on a ward round or assess an elderly patient, you ask them, what's happening? Do you know where you are? Do you know who you are? And then finally, there's a mixed type where they can fluctuate between the two. What are the risk factors for delirium? Well, the biggest risk factor is age and having previous cognitive issues, such as previous delirium, dementia. Comorbidities are also quite a significant risk factor for, for developing delirium. So alcoholism, uh, which can uh, quite significantly impact your, your brain, underlying chronic pain or serious underlying health issues affecting your lungs, your heart, your liver. Um, and then the Last thing is frailty. So anything which from frequent falls to being able to function as a normal person can. So needing support with your activities of daily living, including shopping and dressing, and washing and feeding, and then finally being elderly. So these are the people that you really need to watch out for and make sure you ask, do you know what's happening? Do you know who you are? The cause of delirium, a lot of people use this acronym. Um, and so what you'll find is when you do meet these patients, when, when you're bleeped about them, you can use this acronym, jotting it down in the notes to see, to show and showcase that you've considered all the different things that might be causing their delirium. So pain, that's uncontrolled, an underlying infection, not having nutrition, so not having eaten or drunk any fluids, being constipated, so it's really important to check the bowel chart. Hydration, do they have an AKI, are they tachycardic? Do they have features to suggest they're dehydrated? Medications, particularly things that are sedating. And environment, uh, if it's particularly dark, they don't have their hearing aids, they can't see, they don't know what time is. All of those things can make somebody very disoriented and therefore confused. Another acronym that's often used is delirium. So this stands for drugs, dehydration, detox. Uh, so detox meaning alcohol detox or alcohol withdrawal. Electrolytes, um, so sodium and calcium can very much cause confusion. Environment we talked about before. Lack of sleep um, because of things being very loud, um, bell, bells, alarm bells and things like that can keep a patient up, not let them sleep. Um, infection, but also infarction, a myocardial infarction, renal failure, um, so developing AKI, fecal impaction, also known as constipation. A urinary tract infection is something to be aware of, but is often the thing that everyone immediately assumes is the cause of the delirium. And so this is usually over cold rather than under cold in, in this, this patient cohort. And then metabolic, um, so hypoglycemia, um, abnormal thyroid function and malignancy. So bearing on all of these, my, these in mind, it will tell you roughly what kind of investigations you're going to send off. So your assessment. So you're gonna try and take as much of a history and examination as you can. In that history, what you're going to do is you're going to see, does the, is the patient experiencing any pain? Do they have any focal symptoms such as shortness of breath or cough or, or abdominal pain? 
um, but often you can't really get much in the way of history. You also examine, examine them doing a general review of all kind of systems. So are they tachycardic? Um, are they well perfused? Do they have any abdominal pain? Do they have any crackles on their lungs? It's really important to try and get them to move all of their four limbs or at least passively move them to ensure that they, you aren't missing, that they've had a fall and they've injured themselves. And it's for the same reason really important to have a look at their head and have a look and see if they've got any bruising or any injuries around the face or the back of the head. In your assessment, you should also do an AMTS or abbreviated mental test score. I'll go into the components of that in a second. And if you've got time, particularly if you're on the ward round it's, uh, or you're clerking a patient, it's really important to take a collateral. That's where you speak to the family to work out what is normal for this patient. Are they normally this confused or is this different? Because delirium is acute confusion and it might be that actually they're not delirious, they are just chronically confused and always in the state that, that you're seeing in front of you. So the AMTS or abbreviated mental test score has these components. Age, time of day, name of hospital. You have to provide them an address uh, and often the one that's given is 42 West Street. And then ask a couple of more questions and then recall the address at the end that you can see. They need to recognize two people, for example, what you do for work and what one of your colleagues um, does for work as well. The current year, the name of the queen, their date of birth, date of World War II or something else which is culturally appropriate. Um, and then count back from 20 and, um, and then finally recall their address. It's very difficult to remember these off the top of your head. So what we often do is go, we use applications like MD Calc, where you can simply just go on their website or download their app. And you can then just, just score on there so it's much of an easier, easier way than remembering all of the questions. So what the AMTS does is it measures cognition generally. What it can't do re really well is differentiate between delirium and dementia or some sort of cognitive impairment. So that's important to recognize that what you're looking for is you're looking for an acute confusion. So the AMTS is a lot worse than you would expect it normally to be then that can suggest that the patient has delirium. But the other thing that we can use is the 4AT, which is a specific delirium assessment tool. And this looks at, it's very quick, within two minutes, but it assesses whether you think the patient's got delirium or whether there might be something else going on. And so that looks at their alertness, um, asks part of the AMTS, the AMT4, and then also checks for retention. Um, so in this case, it uses the months backwards. And it asks the question, is this an acute or fluctuating course? So you can have a chat with the nursing staff or, or a collateral from the nursing home, the GP or family to work out whether this is something that's acute or something that's, something that's been quite chronic for many months. The next thing you want to do is you want to send off some investigations. So apart from the observations, you also want to make sure you check the glucose because that's a very easy, quick, thing to identify and fix. You then want to send off some routine bloods and you want to make sure that hematinics have also been sent off. So hematinics meaning B12, folate and iron studies. TFTs, um, so abnormal thyroid function, particularly hypothyroidism and abnormal electrolytes, specifically sodium and calcium, can often contribute to delirium. It's important to send off a urinary, urinary MCNS. And so if you need it in and out specimen, i.e. you put a catheter in the patient and then take it out immediately after to get that clean sample, then you should do so. A urine dip in is not usually reliable because often the patients with delirium are above the age of 65. And above the age of 65, it's quite common for these patients to have asymptomatic bacteria, i.e. bacteria in the urine all the time and therefore they're nitrite positive on a urine dip that actually don't have an infection. So you can't rely on a positive urine dip. What you need to do is either rely on symptoms or treat them empirically whilst waiting for the urine 
MCNS to come back. You must have a chest x-ray on all of these patients. Every patient pretty much admitted under the medical take should have a chest x-ray. And then if you still can't find out, you still can't find a cause of delirium, and none of these, uh, none of these seem to apply, then you want to have a look and see whether, it, whether a CT head is appropriate. And I would have a low threshold for considering a CT head in these patients. What, what you're specifically looking for are any strokes or injuries, bleeding, intracranial hemorrhages, uh, malignancy. There's lots of things that you might pick up. So you should have a very low threshold. If you can't identify raised inflammatory markers, um, the patient is constipated, all the bloods are absolutely plumb normal, I very much would advise um, a CT head to be considered. And so that's the treatment algorithm. You want to identify the underlying cause, you want to support and orientate the patient, and you want to consider medication if necessary, and then exclaim uh, or stall it. So in terms of the underlying cause, it's exactly what, what we've discussed already. So it's by sending off all of those, uh, by doing a history, an examination, sending off all of those investigations, you will hopefully find one of those pinch me or delirium causes of why this is occurring. And if it's drugs, you'll elect to stop or reduce particularly sedating drugs. So opiates are a frequent thing that will cause both constipation um, and also cause, cause delirium in itself. Electrolytes, um, so sodium and calcium, as I mentioned, are the common electrolytes. And so if you find abnormalities of these, you should escalate this to your SHO or registrar to discuss how best to manage this. Constipation. And often in elderly patients, things like Movicol or DocuSafe are very helpful. So Movicol, um, you could give one or two sachets. Um, or DocuSafe, you could give one or 200 milligrams. And these patients can, can benefit from the, these because they tend to be stool softeners or osmotic laxatives. Because often with these elderly patients who haven't been mobilizing so much, their stool gets very hard and by giving them a softening or, or osmotic laxative, you can loosen things up and help them pass stool. If you find their inflammatory markers are raised or they've got temperature, you should look for an infection and try and treat it. UTI, we talked about how it's often not a UTI and you cannot rely on a positive urine dip. You really do need to send a urine MCS for your more than 65, an age of more than 65. And then nutrition and environment. So thinking about do they have access to food, to water, to help as well. So any aids that they might have, such as glasses or hearing aids, it's really helpful to orientate these patients, telling them this is where you are, this is why you're in hospital, that you're in hospital, and this is what we're doing. Because by frequently orientating these patients, it can make it a lot easier for them to be they can feel a lot more comfortable about what's happening. One of the things that you should try and avoid doing is medication. So often what will happen is you're called by the nursing team, uh, you're bleeped because Mr. Andrews is very aggressive uh, and he's very difficult to manage. He's asking lots of questions. He's constantly calling the nurses. And for that reason, they ask whether he could be offered some sedation just to keep, keep him more calm. But it's important to recognise that this might actually not be the most beneficial thing. It can make things worse because it can take a patient from being semi-orientated to completely confused about what this, what's occurring in the situation. The times that medication are more helpful are when the patient is more kind of aggressive, so either at risk to themselves or to others or to staff, because at that point, avoiding the medication is likely to cause a lot more harm than giving the medication. And if you do, you should aim for low and small doses and you can always titrate them up. So we often use haloperidol in most trusts, but you can have a look at your own trust policy. And um, so a small dose like 0 0.5 milligrams orally or IM, uh, so IM meaning intramuscularly, 
Um, the haloperidol, you need to be aware that it can prolong your QT or it can worsen symptoms of Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia. So in these patients, you shouldn't give haloperidol. And instead, you should use lorazepam. Uh, again, 0 0.5 milligrams, which you can give IM or orally. And the idea of this is to essentially keep them sedated enough that they are no longer at risk to others or to themselves. So with all of that in mind, let's say I'm the F1 who's been called to see Mr. Andrews. I've just reviewed him and I'm now going to document to say that I've reviewed him and all of the things that I've done. So what this does is it summarizes all of all of what we've just discussed. Okay. This is how, how one documents, because this was a question that was often asked um, on uh, when you guys were registering for the webinars. So I'll begin with my name, FY1, um, what my title is, so ward cover. So what my role is at that time and the date and the time. I will um, write that I've asked to see this patient, um, so asked to see patient ATSP for confusion by nursing staff. This is an 86-year-old male who's come in with a presenting complaint of a fall with a background of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dementia, the three times uh, per day package of care. You can also do POC, TDS. The history that you've managed to get which is that this patient is aggressive, he's shouting, he's threatening staff with fists. You're unable to engage in any conversation as AMTS is zero out of 10. Then onto examination. It's important to say from, from a medical legal perspective, what you were and what, what you weren't able to do so that if you did miss anything, you can say why you missed it. So, in this case, he was pushing my hands away when I attempted examination, but he was sitting comfortably in his chair. And so what I did was I assessed as much as I could, which is that I saw him uh, moving all of the four, all of his four limbs and seen mobilizing without discomfort. He had bruising over his right lower limbs, uh, right lower ribs, probably from his fall. His abdomen was soft and non-tender. And I was unable to perform a chest examination um, to assess for any cardiovascular or respiratory pathology, but I noted that he didn't have any respiratory distress and his capillary refill time was less than two seconds. Um, in terms of his observations, when I assessed him, his heart rate was 104, his SATs were 94%, his rest rate was slightly elevated to 21, his temperature was 37.9. Um, I also obtained a blood sugar, which was 6.4. Reviewing his investigations, his inflammatory markers were raised, and as we noted uh, when we reviewed the system for his blood tests. And his creatinine was raised above baseline, demonstrating that he had an AKI. He's already had hematinics and liver function tests as part of his routine bloods. Um, he's already had a CT head as part of his delirium screen, and that's negative. His ECG shows the sinus tachycardia. And uh, an important thing I could have mentioned here are there are no ischemic features, because it can be very easy to miss a myocardial infarction when your patient isn't complaining of chest pain or isn't able to complain of it because they're confused. And the chest X-ray is a poor film, but there's features that suggest that there's left basal consolidation. So with all of my assessments, everything taken, in, taken into consideration, my impression is this patient has hyperactive delirium, secondary to a community-acquired pneumonia, and also has acute kidney injury, um, suggested by his creatinine being off his baseline of 64, and he's had a forward rib bruising with no other injury. And that's really important. I've not noted that he's had any other injuries um, such that I'm missing a hip fracture or I'm missing any other fractures anywhere else, which, which are important to pick up and address. So my plan, IV colmoxiclep and fluids, um, which may be your trust policy for a community acquired pneumonia. I attempted verbal de-escalation um, to the chair successfully. And so what I mean by that is that I spoke to him 
and I, uh, whilst he was being aggressive and trying to perhaps, let's say, leave, leave the area. And I said, um, Mr. Andrews, you're in hospital. You're here because you've got a chest infection and we're trying to help you get better. And you've been a little confused. It's a Wednesday. The date is the 7th of April. It's 8.30 p.m. Um, and then basically just keep repeating that until he understands what's happening or at least that soothing and calming voice. And if that doesn't work, then what I will often do is say, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to get you to sit down in a chair. We're going to give you some food, something to drink. And often that's enough to basically calm somebody down and get them to sit in their chair and stop being so aggressive. Because for these patients who are confused out in their own environment, it can be so, so scary to not know what's going on. And often that's what's needed rather than the medications. But if needed, um, what you could do is you can say, look, if this doesn't work, um, particularly because he's being aggressive and threatening with his fists, I will need to consider medication. I'll give him regular paracetamol, um, so one gram QDS. Uh, the reason being is that he's got this fall with rib bruising, and so it might all be delirium secondary to pain. And I will complete the rest of the delirium screen, which uh, include all those invest investigations that I discussed before. So thyroid function tests and bone profile to measure that calcium is what's missed. And then finally, I'll send a urinary MCNS just in case this isn't a chest infection that's caused these raised inflammatory markers. And um, perhaps I'm missing a urinary tract infection. In either circumstance, though, IV colmoxiclab will cover both. So I'm happy that this management plan will cover uh, all situations. The other thing that it's important to do is explain to the family um, what delirium is, because you can often get a lot of complaints, particularly as an F1. So complaints as an F1, the most common reason that you will uh, ever receive a complaint from family or patients is, is lack of communication. And so if you put communication as important, um, if you if you try and aim to communicate well, then you're very much unlikely to get complaints. And so some of the things that I often use uh, are explaining to, to relatives that elderly people can get a bit muddled when their brain is under some stress. And lots of things can cause them to have, to get stress. Um, if they get dehydrated, they get constipated, they develop an infection. Whereas some of us, if we were uh, under stress from all of these things, we would feel a bit unwell, we'd feel dehydrated, we might feel a bit dizzy. For elderly pe people, uh, what tends to happen is their brain tends to get stressed, so they get confused. Even after we treat that underlying trigger, it can sometimes take a few days or a few weeks to get better. And it tends to be more prolonged when they're not in their own environment because they're not used to all of where everything is and it doesn't feel quite familiar, so they don't feel comfortable and therefore they can, therefore being in hospital can make things worse. And so it does tend to get better at home. And so even if they do remain confused, it's often better to, to get them home if we can't find any underlying cause or we've treated the underlying cause where, it's, where it will recover, but it will take time, but it will be quicker than them staying in hospital. And then the final thing to stress is that it can reoccur because it suggests that the patient has a frail brain, which means that any time another stressor affects that patient, they may get delirium again. And it's important to recognise that so relatives don't get scared or worried the next time it happens, because this can be very, very frightening for, for relatives too. And um, often they will say, oh no, does that mean that he's going to be like this the rest of his life? Well, no, it's, the chances are he will recover um, the, pretty well uh, for the most part. Yes, there's a chance that he might not be 100% for, for a few weeks, but they do, these patients do tend to recover and get back quite, get quite close to their normal state. So just to summarize all the things that we've talked about today. We've talked about the different types of delirium. So hypoactive delirium, 
where the patient is lethargic, drowsy, um, not really communicating, not really knowing what's going on. And sometimes this can be really easily missed. And hyperactive delirium, which tends to be the one that hits you in your face because the patient is quite aggressive, moving around, potentially punching. And so these are the ones you're often called about. Whichever the case, the way to approach it is to consider all the different causes and then and an acronym like pinch me is really helpful for that. What you will do is you will do a history, examination, investigations. So history, looking through all the symptoms um, that the patient may complain of, but you may not get much information. An examination to go through their chest, their abdomen, and whether they're moving their limbs. It's also important to do an AMTS so you can assess how confused they are with you so the next person who sees them knows whether they're more or less confused. Bloods, including a full blood count, your uh, use and ease, CRP, LFTs, bone profile, um, thyroid function, hematinics, all of these standard things to have a look and see what might be the underlying cause. Imaging would include a chest x-ray. And if there is any concern that the patient's had a, had a fall, may have injured the head, or you're unsure what the cause of their delirium is, or all of these investigations come back negative and have a low threshold for considering a CT head. But you're best off in, the, um, in your first couple of weeks discussing this with your SHO or registrar. And then finally, the important thing is to find the cause and treat it, because that's what's going to help. Medication will only be a temporary fixing measure and it may actually make the patients worse. So try and avoid these medications unless they're absolutely necessary because the patient themselves are at risk or um, other staff members are at risk or there is a risk of harm to, harm to anyone else. And so that concludes um, all of the things that I wanted to talk about today. And so what's important is that I answer all of your questions. So please send in lots of questions. And it's also important that you fill in your feedback. Um, so we're doing these free webinars to try and help you guys, because I appreciate that a lot of you guys haven't had the same clinical exposure due to COVID. And so we're, we're running these webinars um, to try and help you with that. And, it's, and what we're trying to do is tailor it to what, what you want. So please make sure when you fill out feedback that you give us lots of information on what you find useful, what you would like improved, because we will listen. I will personally be going through all of that feedback over the next day or two, such that we change whatever is necessary for our next session. But also we need that feedback for our own portfolios because we need to evidence, and you'll get the same thing when you're F1s, you'll also need to evidence that you have given teaching and you've got formal feedback. So in the same way that you'll need it, we also need it. So we'd be really grateful if you can fill in feedback. Great, thank you very much, Jack. I actually think that was a really, really good presentation. Um, certainly answered all of my questions about delirium. Um, we have a couple which have come in via the chat, if you're ready to take them now. Yeah, of course. And guys, as Akash said, keep them coming um, and we'll get to all of you. Um, eventually. So um, the first question was, are we requesting an ECG when we review this patient? So I think this was talking about the, uh, the simulated patient you had earlier, given the fact that he was tachycardic and you couldn't carry out a cardiovascular exam. And I'm guessing that, yes, you would try to do an ECG if he was cooperative. Mm, I would 100% agree. So if, if the patient uh, is part of your basic assessment, so every single patient who's admitted under the medical take should have an ECG. And if you're concerned in any way, um, particularly if they're tachycardic, you should definitely get an ECG. So if, if a patient is un unwell, you should request an ECG. And what you can do is when you are on the phone to the nursing staff asking for the observations and you note the fact they're tachycardic, at that moment you can say, look, I'd really appreciate an ECG. I will come as soon as I can because I'm dealing with X, Y, Z tasks. And so it will be helpful to read that ECG when, when I'm there. Yes, there will be times when you can't get an ECG and you can write that down. So you can say, look, I requested an ECG. I was not able to get a good quality trace. 
because the patient was uncooperative or confused. But you Thank need you to demonstrate that you tried. Thanks very much. And Akash, just on the on the last point um, that you said about sort of documenting that you tried, and you referred to this earlier about kind of the medical legal protection of having to say that you've tried to do things when you, you know, when you physically couldn't. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about kind of, um, this might be a bit UK specific, but the dolls, so the deprivation of liberty safeguards, if you do have to give somebody sort of medication to calm them down, etc., is that something you can do as an F1? When would you want to get your kind of seniors involved and when would you consider doing adults? Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Um, let's answer those in turn. So if a patient lacks capacity, um, so essentially to assess somebody's capacity, it's those four pillars that you've gone through on the SJT and gone through lots of many talks. So whether they understand the information that you presented to them, weigh that information, whether they retain that information, whether they can communicate that information back to you. So, for example, if for Mr. Andrews, you could ask him, do you know why you're here? Do you know what's happening? Um, and he'll say, he may say, no, I don't know. I just want to leave the hospital. And then you explain, no, you're here because you've developed a chest infection. Uh, I'm the doctor treating you and we're trying to get you better. And that's why you can't leave. Uh, because it's quite dangerous if you leave and we don't treat your infection. And if he doesn't show any signs of understanding or retaining that, then you can say that he doesn't have capacity um, to make a decision about whether it's safe for him to leave. It's likely that he probably won't have capacity to make a decision about other things too. And so that's when we need to think about what we're going to do. It may be in their best interest to sedate them, and at that point, the first important thing is you do, you do is you do the right thing for the patient. And so if sedating there, um, giving them an IM injection, and you need to do all of that, go ahead and do that. Yeah, I would definitely ask for one of your seniors to be there, just because you need more hands. If you've got a patient who's aggressive like that, it's very, very difficult for you to do it on your own. And so if you've got a patient who's actively trying to leave and you don't think they've got capacity, uh, or even if you do think they've got capacity, it's important to have another person there so you can co-document saying that this is what we both have agreed on for your safety, particularly in your first few weeks. You may need to call security, um, and so the nursing team will help you with that, and they're very, very good at helping restrain a patient safely without harming them. And so Often F1s feel really reluctant to call them, but it's important that you do call them. Your SHOs um, or your registrars can help you make an assessment of what restraint is, uh, what restraint you should and shouldn't use, and how to make sure that you maintain the safety of that patient. And then finally, your last question was on when to use the dolls. So dolls is very UK specific. Um, it's a deprivation of liberty safeguard. Um, and what your what that basically says is is documentation to say this patient does not have capacity, and therefore what I am doing is I'm depriving their liberty in some way. For example, stopping them from leaving hospital, I'm putting on mittens or something to stop them pulling their cannula out, and this is necessary because they lack capacity, and it's in their best interest. And what that paperwork does is it goes. Um, to various departments to ensure that what you're doing is lawful and appropriate. And so that is definitely some sort of paperwork that does need to be done and the nursing team will guide you through the hospital specific paperwork and how the dolls process works for your hospital. But that's usually done in hours and that's usually done by the team that know, know the patient because they would want to discuss that with the relatives. Um, and the final thing to bear in mind is that dolls is likely in the next year or two going to be changed um, to perhaps a new system because it's, it's quite an old system. And so they are planning on updating it, although to be fair, they have been planning on updating it for a number of years. So I can't tell exactly when they will get updated. Does that answer all those questions? I think that does. And it's really useful to go through the practicalities of kind of what you would do on the job, I think. That's something you know a lot of us struggle with. Um, 
another thing I wanted to ask you about this this is from me um we talked about kind of UTIs and when you know when you hear an elderly person has delirium for some reason everybody's mind just jumps straight to oh do they have a UTI and uh you talked about the sort of the unreliable nature of urine dipsticks because of the the, the bacteria that elderly people generally have um would you say that actually it's more reliable to sort of just rely on the clinical signs so things like suprapubic tenderness um you know strange smelling urine etc rather than sending an mcns because that could also come back with a false positive yeah so it's the reason to send the mcns is because we know that there are particular species that are likely to be more pathological and there are particular species that are likely to be less pathological and so the reason that is helpful is if it does if it does come back positive they will characterize what species they are and what what exactly what bacterium it is and how likely that is to be the thing contributing to a urinary tract infection or they will also say whether there are mixed flora meaning lots of different bacteria, suggesting that not one of, that, that, that this isn't a urinary tract infection, it's simply contamination which is causing the nitrites to be positive. And that's the utility in, uh, in getting an MCNS. It allows you to understand whether it's one colony or mixed colonies because the patient's elderly and therefore always has bacteria, which, which is contributing to all of this. But it is important to treat them empirically and use those signs. So if they do have suprapubic tenderness um, it, or they are passing urine more frequently or it does look like it's hurting them when they are passing urine, all of those are great signs to um, suggest that a urinary tract infection is a likely underlying diagnose, diagnosis and you should treat for that. But that doesn't mean it's the only uh, diagnosis and you should always be on the safe side and assume it's multifactorial. What isn't helpful, just to bear in mind, is um, I can smell the urine, it smells strongly. That is not a, a good discriminator for if a patient does have a urinary tract infection. Sure. Thanks very much for that. Um, another thing, so we talked a lot about uh, the treatment, well, not really the treatment of delirium, but kind of how to, how to reorientate people and make sure that they're, you know, that they're okay in hospital, etc. Would you say that those same techniques that kind of useful also in preventing the development of delirium so when you do clerk in a patient would you say that it would be useful to kind of make sure that people are in patients are in regular contact with their family where possible um kind of holding medications that could if they're not needed could have a sedative effect etc i think 100 percent important so if you look at how geriatricians treat treat their patients. Uh, one of the things that they do absolutely massively and massively well is that they stop medications that are likely to be causing more harm than good. Um, so your statins, which might be reducing your muscle mass, um, your PPIs, which might be causing hyponatremia. And um, there's lots of medications that, that they do tend to stop. Um, they do ensure that the patient has all of their hearing aids, their visual aids, etc. Because arguably, if you don't give them all of those things, they might not hear or see the right things to prevent a fall. Um, having your walking stick to make sure that you are um, safe when you're mobilizing, all of these things are quite key. Is there a randomized control study saying if you orientate a person, they're less likely to get hospital-induced delirium? I don't know of one. There might be. Um, but is it important to keep your patients up to date with what's happening with them? 100%. Um, I often advise, particularly for elderly patients who are at risk of delirium, or the relatives to give a couple of pictures or give um, try and call regularly, just because it does, anecdotally, it does, uh, patients do seem to do a lot better uh, when, when those things are done. Yeah, and I guess yeah. it's been even more even more difficult with COVID and everything now with, you know, people not being able to, to see their relatives and doctors being in masks, et cetera, um, healthcare staff kind of having their faces obscured. So uh, no, thank you. Um, we have another question that's just come in and, and keep, keep them coming guys. We've still got a couple of minutes. So if the patient isn't improving without medication, but they're not a risk to themselves or others, would you still prescribe medication? 
Um, so I presume this is medication to sedate them. Yeah, I presume. Uh, yeah, I presume that's the case as well. Um, so I I wouldn't give it, I wouldn't give any medication in that that instance because that actually may prolong the delirium. So sedating medications like lorazepam and haloperidol may may have literally the exact opposite of the effect that you want. They are they are they don't fix or cure delirium. They're simply symptomatic kind of measures to prevent a flare being dangerous, if that makes sense. You, the real thing that's going to cure or treat their delirium is finding the underlying cause and treating that and doing that whole multifactorial approach and making sure you look at every single one of those causes and address every single one of those causes. Right, I think you answered that question perfectly. So. You're saying that, that the, like you said, the medications, haloperidol, et cetera, they don't necessarily treat the delirium. They're only kind of helping you in, in making sure that the person isn't harming themselves or other people. Exactly that. If they're kind of, if they're delirious, sure. Um, that's all the questions that we've got so far. Perfect. Um, if anyone has got any questions on anything outside of delirium or generally about F1, given we've got another 10 minutes, you are welcome to ask. Otherwise, this is a great opportunity for you to fill in your feedback. Oh, so we've got another one, another one just come in. Uh, so let me just read it before reading it out. Okay, so if you've given a patient a sedative, would you ask the nurse to start a behavioral chart to ensure that the drug is having an impact on the patient? So would you kind of start um, sort of behavioral obs after giving, um, after giving a sedative medication? That is a very interesting question. Um, I would probably do it even before you give the medication. If you've got a person who is delirious and having displaying abnormal behaviours in any way, I would automatically put them on a behaviour chart. The reason for that is a behaviour chart is really helpful for uh, the day staff to know what's happening with their patients. So they can impose any safeguards to prevent things from escalating during the night. Discharge planning, so ensuring you know what kind of behaviours your patients are having such that when you discharge them to a home or to their own to their own home or to a residential home, to a nursing home, the wherever they're going is set up in a way which can cope with those behaviours in case they're likely to persist. In terms of asking, answering that question specifically, you aren't really looking for a response to your treatment per se, as in you yourself were, aren't likely to stay there to look for a response to your treatment. All you're looking to see, uh, all, all I would tend to do is ask the nursing staff, um, give this medication, I'll be there whilst you're giving this medication, and I'll stay for a few minutes afterwards just to make sure that the patient um, tolerates that okay or in case things further escalate. And once, once the patient has been given the medication and it's been a few minutes, then I tend to say, look, if there's any further issues, just give me another call. But I think the important thing is that we continue using these verbal de-escalation strategies, um, talking to the patient, reassuring them, telling them what's happening, where they are, and trying to get them to sit down or sit in their bed and keep trying those treatment strategies. And if they don't work, please give me another call. I'm more than happy to come to, to give you another hand. And if you do get called again um, and you're asked to see the same situation for anything, anything you ever do in medicine, if you're called for a second time, you should definitely ask for a senior just to give you a hand to make sure that if there's anything else you could do um, that, that it's done. We always prefer to come to situations early and fix them before they get worse. The last thing I want to do is get to a delirious patient after they've been confused, agitated, moving around, walking around. They've fallen, they've then injured themselves. They've now got intracranial hemorrhage and then I'm called. I'd rather be called much, much, much earlier. So please escalate as soon as you think that you're like, mm, I'm not exactly sure or this situation is not exactly something that I'm familiar with, just escalate immediately. Thanks, Akash. And I think, yeah, as you say, that's really important, just getting help 
as early as possible, making sure that your seniors are aware of uh, what's happening. Um, so anyone who's still watching, keep the questions coming. Um, Akash is happy to answer anything um, within reason about uh, medicine, um, F1, applications, etc. And also, if you want to leave any feedback about the webinar or suggested topics in the comments, um, that would be great. Okay, so we've got a non-delirium related question. That's fine. Um, so first of all, Akash, uh, really enjoyed the teaching session. That's always good news. Um, so this question isn't related to delirium. Um, the person who's posted it has recently found themselves working as a GPST in ED. Uh, they want to ask how much of a mental health history is warranted in ED in the ED setting while seeing patients that come in with mental health causes such as a paracetamol overdose. So sort of if you if somebody presents to ED with with a manifestation of a psychiatric condition like having overdosed, etc. How much of a mental health history, I guess the question is asking is down to you in ED to take and how much yeah, of, of course. You your colleagues in, in psychiatry? So I think what we need to understand is that all of these patients will uh, be seen by the psychiatric services as soon as it's possible to see them. So if it's a paracetamol overdose, they should be well, and they should be alert, they should be awake and be able to answer all those questions. But if they are drowsy or they've taken something which has made them quite confused, agitated, it can be really difficult to get their history. I think the important thing to identify at that moment in time is um, is there anything major that's going to um, uh, affect how you treat that patient and then also what's the risk to that patient so the important things to ask are any previous overdoses uh, what their intent was with the overdose were they aiming to kill themselves or uh, did they think that the overdose would kill themselves did they use any um, measures to try and avoid detection? Did they plan this or was this a spare of the moment activity? And then finally in their past uh, psychiatric history, uh, what, what psychiatric diagnoses do they do? Do they have? Um, how does it impact them? Have they had any treatment for that? I think these are all key questions that are going to affect how you treat that patient there at that moment. Um, and it's also important that you pass on all of that information because patients may only be happy to talk to the first doctor that they meet. And then after that, um, when, they, when they kind of reflect back on the situation, feel really upset or angry or annoyed, they may shut down. So the more information you can get, the better for the patient. But I also appreciate that in an ED setting you may need to move on to the next patient to ensure that they get safe and effective and quick treatment. So it, it's balance, which, which you can only get really with practice. I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks very much, Akash. Are there any more questions, Nourish? Not at the moment, no. Perfect, so um, what we'll do is we'll um, close the session right there. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending this talk on delirium. You can still continue asking lots of questions. And the best way to do that is by leaving a comment on the article on the Mind the Bleep page uh, on delirium. But also you can email them, uh, email them through at mindthebleep at gmail.com. I'm more than happy to answer as many more questions as you've got. We'll have another seminar, uh, we'll have another webinar next week. If you haven't registered uh, for webinars, again, check out the Mind the Bleak page. There is a link to register um, and like the page so that you get these notifications, but they run every week from 8 to 9 p.m. And we've got plenty of um, talks lined up. So do make sure you register to make sure that you get in the notifications and make sure you attend. But yeah, once again, thank you so, so much for attending today's talk and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thanks, Akash. That was great. Pleasure.